Good morning. We're glad that you're here on Friend Me Sunday. Next week, we're also doing Friend Me. And uh, you notice the t-shirts? You can get one for yourself and invite a friend uh, for next Sunday, which is Resurrection Sunday. Have y'all noticed that uh, when I was growing up, we always called it Easter? Y'all know why churches have quit calling it Easter and started calling it Resurrection Sunday? They're trying to disassociate from the little bunny and the eggs and trying to put the emphasis where it belongs. And so that's been an effort because uh, secularization of our uh, holidays, which, you know, the word holiday came from holy days, uh, the secularization that has happened in this country, both of Christmas and Easter, uh, takes away from what would they really represent to us who are people of faith. Um, I didn't plan on doing this, but when uh, Jason was asking how many of you is their first time here, once again, uh, let's see, how many first time here today? Okay, it's good to see you. Usually the question that is asked, and people always have a lot of questions about a church, one of the first questions that people lean over and ask and poke whoever invited them is, why isn't he wearing shoes? It is. Did you think that? Have you thought that since you've been in here? Why is he wearing, not wearing shoes? He's just got on socks. And I have people, and I don't talk about this very often, so we have people come and go, and they say, does he have a foot problem? You know, what's, what's the issue here? So let me tell you the story of why I don't wear shoes on Sunday mornings. We had not been in this building very long. Uh, you, we moved in this building 21 years ago, I guess, 20, 21 years ago. We hadn't been in here very long, and I was preaching about Moses' encounter at the burning bush. Do you all remember that story? Where God speaks to him from the burning bush and tells Moses, take off your shoes for the ground where you're standing is holy ground. And the question that came to my mind right then as I was standing up here is, what constitutes holy ground? Was there something special about that sand in the middle of the desert before that bush? Or what was it that made that ground holy? Holy ground is wherever you encounter God, and God comes and speaks to you. And so I was thinking, that means every Sunday when we come here and we open his book, we should be expecting to encounter God. This is holy ground. So I took off my shoes that morning and said, from now on, when I stand up to open God's Word, I'm going to expect to meet God and therefore take my shoes off. Now, there have been a couple of times I've forgotten. It hadn't been that long ago. I came down from the baptistry, sat down, it was time to stand up, and I looked down halfway through the service. I said, my shoes are on. Nobody's called me on it yet. But as soon as service was over, there were about 20 people said, hey, you forgot your shoes. So uh, we have people that do that every now and then to get to it. But that's, that's the symbolism that's behind not wearing shoes. And so, you know, there are a lot of things that we do that are symbolic, and they really don't have a lot of meaning. One of them is, for instance, church attendance. And in the Old Testament, one of the complaints that was there that, that Jesus, as we look back, recognized what was going on there is the prophet said to the people, with your lips you praise me, but your heart is far from me. Have you thought about, I look across congregations and I, I can't see now like I used to, so I just see figures more than I see faces, but I try to see faces when I've got a good day and I can see a little bit better. But the question is, you're here in figure, but is your heart where it needs to be? Because so many times we go through the motions and do what we do, because we want other people to see what we're doing and think something of us. And you know, sometimes we go to church to please mom and dad. Sometimes we go to church to please spouse. Sometimes we go to church because we think our kids need to be there. <clears throat> and sometimes we go to church and the whole time we're there, we're thinking of lunch or the golf course or the river or the lake and the bass boat and all of that. But how many of us come in and we focus our thinking upon what does God have to say if he were to speak to me today? What does God have for me to pick up today? And that's what I want to pray for before we get into the message this morning. 
Father God, I pray that your word would take root not only in our hearts, in our minds, but in our hearts as well, that we would not worship you simply with our lips in songs of praise and adoration, but we would worship you with our hearts. For we know the heart is the seat of volition, and that we would give ourselves to you this morning, that you can make a difference, and that you can change us if we will allow you to do so. It's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, our message this morning, and I'm, I'm, I do a devotion every morning at 7.15, and I'll tell those of you who listen to that, it's on the pastor's page, it's on our website here, is I'm going to be looking all week long at John chapter 19. I love the book of John, and I love especially John's uh, story of what took place at the cross. And one of the reasons I like that so much is because John, as far as we know, was the only one of the disciples who stood at the foot of the cross. He stood there with Jesus' mother, and so he knew what was going on there. He saw it firsthand, and there's nothing like a firsthand account of things. You see, there's a big difference when you have experienced in yourself and when you're telling somebody else's story. And so often we find people, even in their Christianity, they're just telling somebody else's story. Uh, they're t saying what they heard growing up, but they've not had that personal experience with Jesus Christ. And like Jason was saying just a few minutes ago, my prayer is that you will know him personally, not just what somebody else has told you about him. And you do that by coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and we learn about him through the Word. When Jesus was on the cross, there are a lot of interesting things that happen in John 19, where it really bears down to that week of passion. And if you have not received, uh, Colin, y'all are handing out those this morning, right? When you leave this morning, you're going to get an envelope that has devotions for every day this week that is known as Passion Week for you to be able to have a devotion and a Bible study, and it has a kid's thing on the back of it for the kids to be able to work through that as well. So if you're a parent or a grandparent, our idea is this week to focus on the cross and to look at the cross, and we're going to do so next week. We're going to focus more on the resurrection. In the last years, when we come to what we call Palm Sunday, we focused on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. The, the, and that's great, and we need to. But what happens sometimes is you focus on his entry into Jerusalem, then you focus on the resurrection and you leave out a little bit of the cross. And so this week we're going to try to really push the cross all week long. Now as I went through the book of John in chapter 19, I started seeing elements in that story that I wanted to pull out and put a microscope on. And as we did that, it was interesting, Jason came in and he was talking about the signboard. You can see we've got a sign hung over the cross here, which would have been pretty close to what Pilate hung above the cross. The very top up there, let me, let me see, I think I, I've got one here that I can have to always remember to turn this thing on. Here it is, I tried to amplify it, that's what's hanging on the cross here. If you look at that top, it's in Hebrew. Anybody want to read it for me? No? You look at the second one, those of you who've taken Latin, it's in Latin. Can you read that? It's more of a read language than a spoken language, isn't it? <laughs> Unless you're in the courtroom. And then the last one, the bottom one, is in Greek. Anybody want to read the Greek? Do you know what they all say? All three of them say the same thing. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's what all three of them say. Today we want to look at the signboard that's on the cross and look at what it says to us today as well as what it said to them. And one of the interesting things when we look at it is we see that this is recorded not just in John but in the other Gospels. And when we look at the other Gospels, Matthew calls it an accusation. Mark and Luke call it an inscription. And John calls it a title. I like the way that John calls it a title because that is who he is. He is the king of the Jews. But guess what? He's not only the king of the Jews. He's king of the entire world. He's king of the entire universe. 
And so we're going to see this morning that you have a choice in that kingdom. You're going, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, but have you made him your king or do you live in open rebellion to his kingship? Let's back up, and we'll go back a couple of slides here, and let's read together verses 19 through 22. If I really had the time, and I'll do it throughout the week, we would read the whole chapter of chapter 19 and see the various things that are there. But if you would, please stand with me in the honor of God's Word, and we'll read it together. And Pilate wrote an inscription also and put it on the cross and it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore this inscription uh, many of the Jews read, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Father, we pray that you would bless our time together this morning in your word that your Holy Spirit would give us insight and application. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's some interesting things about this sign that we find here and that we want to talk about briefly. One thing is that any time someone was crucified, there was a soldier who was assigned to take and walk in front of the cross and, and show to all the people along the roadside what the charges were against this person that they were about to kill. So he would take the sign, and he would walk in front of the cross, and the sign would read as to the allegations, the charges that were made against this person who is going to be crucified. And so the reason the victim was being crucified, the crime he had committed, and evidently this is what happened to the Lord. What happened to him was not something that was uncommon. Somebody else would carry a different one. Each of the gospel writers, as we said, report it from their own perspective. And if you've not discovered already, when you read the different gospels, you find out that they have a different perspective or or viewpoint. Matthew is writing for the Jews. Mark is writing for the Romans. And Luke is writing for the common people. And John is writing for the whole world. He's writing for everybody. And so it is a statement of completeness. It's for everybody. It's sort of like people say, well, why don't all of them say the same? Isn't that a contradiction? No, it's like if you were out here on the highway and you saw an accident and there were four people who saw the accident and the policeman called each one of the four over to talk, each one of them would have a different perspective on what they saw. Why? Because maybe you're standing in a different position. Maybe it's because you saw something I didn't see. Have you ever run across that? I have in many different ways and in areas. Tell us about it. It's why I go on a trip or hear people going on a trip. I say, tell me what you saw. Tell me what you did. Because every person has a different viewpoint. On this signboard, we have all the same thing, though. It agreed. We have the proclamation This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now think about that signboard with me, and think about the message that gives us the meaning and the purpose of the cross. And the first thing that I would say to you is it was controversial. It was controversial. You say, what do you mean it was controversial? Well, the Jews didn't like what Pilate wrote. (laughs) we find controversy right off. Hasn't Jesus always been the center of controversy? Look at it, the Jewish leaders, Pilate wrote the signboard, and there were, at this time of year, even this year, there are thousands of Jews that come from all parts of the world for one of the festivals of the Jewish people known as Passover. So they had come from all over the world to observe this. 
The chief priests, all of the rulers of the Jews, had engineered the situation, as we know as we've read the gospel, that they're wanting to get rid of Jesus at this time. They're wanting to be done with him. We've been reading about that. We'll continue to read about that. They had rejected him as the king of the, uh, the Jews, of the Jewish people. In fact, John 1.11 says he came to his own, and those who were his own did what? They rejected him. They didn't receive him. And then I thought I'd fix this slide so you could read the whole thing, but you can't. So let me read it to you. They therefore cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Can you imagine how they felt when they who were so anti-Christ walked and they saw this sign? It absolutely irritated them. They had fixed it so Jesus would be rejected but also killed. Imagine the sadistic pleasure that they had when they finally got news. Hey, guess what? Pilate's going to let us crucify him. But then they go to the place of the crucifixion, and here's this sign right in their face. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. They were filled with rage, so they cried out, We have no king but Caesar! We have no king but Caesar! It's interesting, all through the centuries they had been waiting for a king, a deliverer. John 1.11 tells us he came to his own, but they would not receive him. He came indeed to be their king. He was presented as their king on Palm Sunday, but they rejected it. They were not happy about the sign at all. So they sent an official delegation to Pilate to protest. Isn't that the way things go? And so Pilate is the compromising politician. Now it amazes me when we look at Pilate, and we could do a whole message on Pilate. He's a rather amazing individual to me. When Pilate had the opportunity to save the life of Christ, he com completely caved in to the Jewish leaders, crumbled at their demands. He could have spared Jesus. And you'll remember, he tried to excuse himself from it. But when it came to the sign on the cross, he was absolutely unyielding. He was obstinate in the wrong place. He was refusing to bulge in the wrong place, refusing to budge. He simply wanted out of his hands. And you know, we came up with a saying that came from this. He wanted to, what? Wash his hands of the whole deal. Did you ever wonder where that saying, wonder where that saying came from? Right here. To wash your hands of the deal? He wanted to wash his hands of the whole matter. He had no interest at all in Jesus on the cross. So they come to him, and what do they say to him? They say to Jesus, chief priests and Jews said to Jesus, do not write. Now here's what's interesting. In the Greek language, that verb, or do not write, is in the present tense. And so what it really is saying is quit writing. <laughs> Stop writing that he is the king of the Jews, but he said I'm the king of the Jews. And what's interesting is Pilate's reply in the very next verse, and the tense of the verb changes. Pilate changes and uses the perfect tense of the verb. So it means, here it stands, it will not change. So Pilate said, what I've written, I have written. Do you know I thought about that? Right now, while we're here on this earth, we have the opportunity to change what is being written. You remember that poem that you maybe learned as a kid? You're writing a, a poem, a verse each day by the things that you do and the things that you say. What is the gospel according to you? Because people will look at you or supposedly see what a Christian is supposed to be like. And one day we're all going to stand before God. And one day you will have written all that you're going to write. What will your life say? Pilate says, I've written what I've written, that's it. No more to it. You know, Pilate put their rejected king on a cross, and that was controversial. I can say to you today without equivocation, and I think without controversy or without anybody challenging me, the cross is still controversial. 
If you question that, you try to go out into one of our federal public places and you put a cross up and see what happens. Or, you know, you can go to any of our basketball games and any of the schools, you can go anywhere of the public places and they're pumping in all of this, we will, we will rock you, we are the champions and stuff like that. What do you think would happen if you would start to play at the cross at the cross? How far do you think you would get with that? The truth is, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. And verse 23 says, to the Jews the cross is a stumbling block, and to the Greek it is foolishness. That is true all across our country today. People look at the cross, they look at Christianity as being foolish, and they are hostile to it today. He is the rejected king. With a shooting in Covenant this last week in Nashville, there are those who said, well, it was a hate, hate crime because of the lettered community, and others say it's a hate crime for Christianity. And they said it was justified because Christianity hates the lettered community. Do you see how Christianity stirs hostility today? The question is, what have you done with Jesus? Can you say Jesus is king, or are you hostile to Jesus? What's Jesus ever done to you? What's Jesus ever said? What has Jesus ever done in your life that would make you hostile to him? The message is controversial. Pilate did more than he realized that day. When Christ was crucified, they put up that signboard. Pilate meant it as a cruel joke. But what he didn't understand is he was writing truth. He wrote more than he realized because Jesus is king. Before Jesus Christ was born, the Bible says his, of his kingdom, there will be no end. When he was born in Bethlehem, wise men came from the east and said, Where is he who is born the king of the Jews? for we have seen a star in the east. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything the Jews had been expecting, all they anticipated. He's the fulfillment of King David and all of his glory. He's the fulfillment of Solomon and all of his wisdom. He's the king of the Jews, but he is more than the king of the Jews. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ is the king of the world. He rules and reigns as king. And one of these days, he's going to return, and he's not going to come back on a gory cross, he's going to come back on a glory cloud. The first time he came to suffer and to die for those who would receive him, next time he comes in victory with a sword to rule and to take over. And folks, I think that can be any day now. Jesus indeed is a king. He's the king of my life. As a seven-year-old boy, second seat, center section, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, bowed my knee, and crowned him King of kings and Lord of lords in my life. Pilate is writing on that day, but God was writing as well through Pilate who thought he was writing a cruel joke. You see, when you study the cross, you find God's all over this story. You find it everywhere. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb who was slain from the foundations of the world. And it's as if God could say, I have written what I have written. <laughs> there it stands. No one can erase it. He's the king of the kings. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of the world. But we also find here that the cross, the message of the cross, is universal. The inscription was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Now, it's commonly believed that when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified outside the northern gate on the roadway headed toward Damascus, a public highway. That means people could walk by where he was crucified and he could be seen. The Romans did this to sort of tell people, hey, if you're a criminal, this is what's waiting for you, and try to use it as a deterrent to crime in the area. So it could be seen. It didn't really matter who you were, where you were from. You could walk by and you could see the result of the criminal in that day. This sign was written in three main languages of that day. I said it was written in Hebrew, the language of the Jews, the Greek, the language of the culture, 
and Latin, the language of the Romans. And I want to look at each of those a little bit closer. Because the cross applies to every area of our lives, I think these three languages apply to every area of our life. In those days, Hebrew was the language of religion. And that tells me that he is the Lord, he is the king religiously. He has the final word on religion. Now, what I have found, and I don't understand, is you bring up the subject of religion or salvation or how to get to heaven, and it's amazing to me how everybody has an opinion on it and everybody think they're, thinks they're an expert. If you've ever talked with many people about spiritual things or religious things, you'll find that people instantly become authorities. They know everything, and they'll tell you exactly what their opinion is or what they think about how you get to heaven. I'll talk to people and ask them about their relationship with Christ, and they say, well, I believe, and they immediately tell you what they believe, and I say, well, what is the basis of your belief? What is the basis of your belief? Can I tell you? It doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. What really matters is what does Jesus have to say about it? He's the final word on how you get to heaven. It's not what men think about salvation. It's what God says in the Bible about salvation. He is the Lord of religion. And we have all kinds of churches. And if you Look, I had a guy come by here one time and said, well, I'm trying to find a church that believes like I do. I said, Lord, help us. But we've got a whole generation of people who wander all over town trying to find somebody who believes like they do. The problem is they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They feel like that the Bible is inspired in spots, and they're inspired to spot the spots. You know, I'll take a little heaven, but I don't believe hell is real. I'll take a little bit of God's love, but I, not that love your neighbor stuff. My neighbor, if you knew him, you couldn't love him either. And so they pick and choose what they're going to take. Folks, that's not it. Jesus is the Lord of religion. Put it up there in Hebrew. Put it up there in Hebrew. He's the Lord of religion. And if he does it, his, his word is final in that. But then he uses Greek. You have to understand in that day, while the Romans ruled the known world, the language of the day was Greek. Why? Anybody have a clue? Historians? Because of something that happened a couple hundred years earlier with a man by the name of Alexander the Great, who had conquered all the known world in that day. And when he went, he took the culture of Greek with him everywhere and took the Greek language for the common man, which is known not as classical Greek, but Koine Greek. Koine means common. It's the same word from which we get our word for a coin. I thought I had a coin in my pocket, but I don't. And so Koine Greek is there, and the Greek represented the culture of the day. All true culture, however, I would have you know, culture becomes crudity when it is not centered around the Word of God. You may think you have culture. In fact, you may eat caviar and wear your glasses on a stick. But if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you don't understand what culture is. Jesus is the one who refines the human heart and beautifies the life. He's the one who gives meaning and purpose to life. He's the one that makes literature come alive and beauty be all that it's intended to be. Put it up there in Greek because he's the Lord of culture. If you're a Christian, it ought to change your daily behavior and your lifestyle it ought to demonstrate to a world that has a corrupted worldview that the worldview of Jesus refines and beautifies and glorifies human existence. He says, write it in Greek. We're going to come back to that. Then he said, write it in Latin. Latin was the language of the Roman Empire. It was the language of law and government. By the way, it still is. It was the language of law and government. And what did it mean? What did it represent? Well, Jesus is the Lord 
of all government. Jesus is the law, uh, is the Lord of it all. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. It's saying Jesus is the Lord politically. And I'm not going to spend time here because we're all pretty sick of government right now and politics, at least in our country. And with all of the indictments and things going on around the country, you hear a lot about the rule of law. It's amazing to me how one side takes it and then the other side takes it, depending on who's in power and how they want to use that. Nature's law and the rule of law. I'm afraid it's a phrase that many have had, uh, have, may, have, may not have had an impact on, a, on the American society. It should have, because so, pe- so many people are just so ignorant of the government we have. We call ourselves a democracy, but we're not a democracy according to the founding papers of our country. We are a... And you know the difference in a democracy and a republic? I think we're closer to a democracy today than we've ever been because people are throwing out the law and doing what they think the majority wants to do. But that's not on which our country is founded The media needs to understand we don't rule this country by polls and what people think is right and wrong. Republic means ruled by law. If the majority of people said it was all right to murder in this country, would it be okay? No, we don't operate that way. We operate on the basis of objective standards and laws. And if you look at our founding documents, most of them came directly or indirectly from Judeo-Christian principles. Like I said, I wasn't going to say too much, didn't I? Lord Jesus Christ is the one whose laws become the standard of our behavior. And Jesus may be controversial, but you take the words and teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ out of the laws of our land and we go back to the jungle. Let's see where I'm going or where I lost. Here we are. I caught up with my notes now. And I I put this on the screen because I wanted to be very clear. The culture war that's going on in this country right now is a war between those who believe that man is the ultimate authority and the final rule of behavior and those who believe that God and his word is the ultimate authority and the final rule of behavior. I'm going to say right now, So there's no misunderstanding whatsoever. I take my stand on the side of the Lord. I'm going to take my stand on the side of what Jesus has to say about it, that he and his word is the final authority and rule of behavior. I don't care what the government or the majority has to say. He's the final authority. Now each one of you have to decide. Each one of you have to decide. We get masses and mobs together trying to change the rule of law. Are we going to give in to it? That's a form of domestic terrorism. What is written is written. Okay, said too much there. Let's go on. The message of the cross is universal. What do I mean by that? It goes into every corner of life in its application. It's universal in its invitation. When Jesus, put that, when Jesus died and they put the signboard on the cross, he was saying the whole world is invited to salvation. God is saying, whosoever will, let him come. One of the things you can't miss when you study the book of John is that Jesus Christ is set forth as the Savior of the world. You remember that John the Baptist in John 1.29 saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You would have expected him to say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of Israel. Because the Lamb and the sacrifice of the Lamb was something Israelites understood. Next week we'll trace the blood of Christ all the way from Genesis down through where we are now. But you see, what John was telling us, the sacrifice of Jesus was not just for one nation. It says what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's why we all love John 3.16 so much, isn't it? 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish. You remember the woman at the well? She heard about Jesus and he said he could give her a drink of water of life. And she went running back to the village and she said, what to them? Hey, I've met this guy who knows everything I've ever done. This is the Christ, isn't it? And these guys came out and they met Jesus. And you go down to verse 42 of that same chapter of John 4. They come back and say, now we know this man is the Christ. We don't believe because you told us. We believe because we've had an encounter with him. There's no longer second-hand knowledge, it's first-hand knowledge. That means anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. There's no respecter of persons. It means it doesn't matter what race you are, what nationality you are. doesn't matter whether you come from the right side or the wrong side of the tracks. doesn't matter who you are. You can come to the cross and be saved. It is universal. The Bible says, Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are or how dumb you are. You can have a PhD or a no D. It doesn't matter to God because we're all saved the same way. All saved the same way. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. Not only does it not matter how intelligent you are, it doesn't matter how rich you are. You can have a dime in your pocket or you can have millions in your pocket. Even if you have millions, God will still save you. You're not hopeless. If you're here today and you have absolutely no culture at all, it doesn't matter who you are, Jesus died for everybody. There was a signboard that day, and on that signboard it said, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. But he's more than the King of the Jews, he's the King of anyone and everyone who will come unto him. <clears throat> because you see, really, that signboard is personal. Think for a moment that it's just you and me talking. Pretend there's nobody else here but you and me. Shut out everybody else. I want to say to you that the cross means that you can have a personal Savior. It's an interesting thing. On the signboard, it was placed, it was supposed to be placed, the crime of the person who was being crucified. Yet when you read this signboard, there's no crime mentioned. It simply says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Why? Because when Jesus died on that cross, he was not dying for any crime he had done. In fact, Hebrews 4.15 tells us, he was in all ways tempted like we are. How? Yet without sin. Nobody could point to the life of Jesus and call him a sinner or accuse him of sin. In fact, in John 8, 46, he asked the question, which one of you convicts me of sin? Nobody could say a single word. I want to challenge anybody here today. Anybody here think that nobody can convict them of sin? Who convicts me of sin? I wouldn't say that. I've got kids and I've got a wife. It lets you know real quick. That's not so. But Scripture and history conclude that Jesus was without sin. In fact, let's go back to even then. Pilate said in verse 6, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. Judas, in Matthew chapter 27, when he had delivered him to be betrayed, Judas said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 41, they said, This man's done nothing amiss. Because you see, Jesus wasn't dying on the cross for his sin. He was dying for your sin and my sin. And when we look at the cross and we look at that signboard, we see... Jesus, King of Jews, we see one thing. And when God looks at that signboard, God sees something else. How does God see the cross? Colossians 2.14 Having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. 
He took your sin, he took my sin, and he nailed it to the cross. There was a signboard on the cross that day. God saw more than a signboard. He saw all of the accusations against us, and he nailed it to the cross. In those days when a man owned a debt that he could not pay, they would post publicly that debt could not be paid. In fact, sometimes when a man would admit that he couldn't pay the debt, they would have an open public acknowledgement he couldn't pay the debt. That day at the cross, all of the debt, all of the sin that were against us were nailed to the cross, debts that we cannot pay, sins for which we cannot atone, that day at the cross, all of our sins were nailed on the cross. And praise God, the Bible says that God blotted out the handwriting of the ordinance. Go look at that word, canceled out. It means to blot out. God blotted out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us. Your sin and my sin were laid on Jesus that day. He's our personal Savior he personally paid for our sins. The cross means that you can have personal salvation. You say, did anybody ever get saved by that signboard on the cross? Yep, sure did. John nineteen eighteen says that where he was crucified, there were two thieves. Actually crucified along with him. One on each side. Jesus was in the middle, but on either side, you'll remember at the beginning of the crucifixion, they both were reviling Jesus and saying, come down and do this and do that. But somewhere along the way, something changed in one of those thieves. Luke twenty three forty two, one of the thieves speaking said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Kingdom? Where did he get the idea Jesus had a kingdom? King of the Jews. Here's a man dying on the cross. And here's a poor thief saying, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Where did the thief get the idea Jesus was a king? Written right there. Written right there. On that signboard, it said Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That one little statement became a gospel track for that thief. That thief who was the on, on the edge of eternity, just seconds away from hell, read that one sentence on the signboard, and God sent a message to his soul. And the thief said, Lord, remember me. This man is a king. He's not a criminal. He's a king, and he'll take me into his kingdom. He makes a very simple request. Wouldn't you like to be saved? This guy said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't know what words to say. He just expressed the desires of his heart. There are people out there who say, if you'll pray this prayer, now don't miss any of these words, say it exactly like it is, you'll be saved. Look, salvation is not in repeating words. Salvation comes with a sincere desire of the heart to die to self and allow Christ to come in. To cease any attempts to be good enough. Say, Lord, if it's dependent upon me, I'll never make it. But you said, if I would invite you into my heart and trust you, that you'd come in. You say, that sounds too simple. Well, don't you think God... Wants it to be? Do you think God wants it to be hard to be saved? 
You think God would make it difficult for you to be saved? The Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's the matter of how sincere is it. Do you really mean it? This guy's on the edge of eternity. He doesn't have time to play games. He doesn't have anyone to impress. He doesn't have time to be the hypocrite. He's getting ready to die. By the way, so are you. Just a heartbeat away. Every beating of your heart, you're one beat closer to eternity. And when that last beat takes place, you're in eternity. And you're either saved or you're lost. How simple it is to be saved. How sincere. It's enough. And you see what Jesus said to him? Because he was sincere about it. What did Jesus say to him? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That morning, the thief had breakfast with the devil. That night, he had supper with the Savior. The signboard says to you and to me, salvation is universal. It's for everyone. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. Oh, the wonderful cross, the wonderful cross. Have you been to that cross and by faith received Jesus? What he did for your salvation? If you've not, you can do that right now. The Bible says that if we'll repent of our sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. How do I get that gift? He's very clear. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never done that before, you can do it right now. Do it right now. Best way, express the desire of your heart. Be sincere with it. However God leads you to pray. Father God, I pray that your message will have gone out and done the work that you desire it to do. We know for many it's a message of salvation. For many it's a confirmation of a decision to deny you, just like those Jewish leaders. I pray, Father, that it will be a message to receive you, not the hardening of the heart who denies you. During this time of public confession, public invitation, we pray that your Holy Spirit would have his way in leading. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, our time, we're going to stand together, but our invitation is going to be a video with a song. And if there's a decision you should make, we ask you to come during this time. And I'll be glad to talk with you, whether it's confessing Jesus as your Savior. We've got one who's requested be, to be baptized next Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. You want to come, be a part of this family of faith. If you want to come and just make these steps an altar of prayer, you come as the Lord leads as we stand and we watch the video.